Good evening. Good evening. Nice looking bunch of folks here on a rainy night. We appreciate so much your attendance and your being with us. I asked to be down here because I wanted to look you in the eyes tonight and see what you, was on your mind. No, I just want to like being a little closer. Next month, remember that it's on the 10th, I believe, of December. Eight, you're right. Twelve eight <laughs> at North Bottom. So please put that on your calendar tonight and be there next month and for uh, our youth service over there. So tonight I want to talk about succeeding and how do we have success, and particularly as a young person, how do we have success? But it will apply to all of us. And you know, success means a couple of things. First, it means that we have fulfilled our purpose. That whatever we were made for, that's what we were able to do. And that we are, whatever we've been created for, that's what we fulfill. And whatever we have set as a goal, we're able to reach that goal. And when we do those kinds of things, we say we're a success. And in this particular thought tonight, we want to think about the kingdom of God. How do we become successful in the kingdom of God? How do we become successful in reaching the kingdom of God? Now, success takes some work, and sometimes it takes a lot of activity, and it takes this effort that we have to put forth. We don't become successful by sitting on our hands. We don't become successful in school by not studying. We don't become successful in school or on our sports teams without putting forth the effort to practice. How many of you have ever been on a sports team? How many of you have ever been on any kind of team? Okay. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And young people, I know you're thinking, what's he talking? He probably was never on a sports team. He's too old. <laughs> Look at that. You know, that first one there, I was running track for Celeste, Texas. Celeste Blue Devils. All right. I ran the half mile. Most of the time I could make it to the end of the line. The other one is, is I was a Calera Bulldog. That's a senior picture. I was playing basketball. McKenna? Yeah. We don't have that gym anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so what's the point? Tell me, what's the point? Here's the point. Young people, sometimes old folks know what they're talking about. Sometimes old folks have been through the exact same thing you're going through right now. We've, we've experienced the same experiences. So think about older Christians, and it's all right to talk to them. It's all right to listen to them. It's all right to ask them, hey, how did you get to be successful in this congregation? How did you get to be successful in this kingdom? What did you do? Well, you know, when we're on these sports teams or any kind of thing, we usually have a coach. We usually have a teacher. And coaches usually say things like this. You got to be better than the other guy. You got to work harder than the other guy. You got to practice harder. You got to have better skills. You got to shoot better. You got to tackle better. You know, you got to hit the ball better. They never say, well, they're better than us. We can't beat them. In fact, you know, we're not even going to practice anymore because we know we can't win a game. Coaches don't talk like that, do they? No, it's just the opposite. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We all know this setting. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Christ has to call his disciples to him. It started like a classroom. <laughs> like the locker room, he's got his disciples around him, and he's about to tell them some things. He's about to teach them. He's going to educate them on what they need to do to be successful in this kingdom. How they're going to make it, how they're going to win, he's about to tell them. And Jesus is going to say, you know, it's important for you to enter this kingdom. John had just been talking about this kingdom that was coming, that was at hand. Jesus, earlier in this sermon he has told them you know if you're going to enter the kingdom 
Here's some, here's some attitudes and some be attitudes, some things you need to do to enter this kingdom. If we look down to verse 20, very important verse, key verse. It says, if I can find it here. I changed Bibles again this morning. Yeah, it's a bad thing. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, you've got some things to do. You've got to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, scribes and the Pharisees. That's who you're up against, and you've got to do a better job than they're doing. You've got to win over them. You've got to beat them. And they're looking around and said, what is he talking about? What does he really mean about this? He's saying that we have to be better than these scribes and Pharisees. These, this is the best team in town. You know, let's look at these words a little bit. Righteousness, what does that mean? He says, your righteousness, what you're going to be doing has got to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, when we look at the word righteousness in the New Testament, it's talking about that we're justified. It's talking about that we're standing right with God, that we're doing the right things, that we're standing right in God's sight, that our behavior is the kind of behavior that God expects of us. And as he looks at us, he says, you're doing what I want you to do. You're right. Hebrew word means justice here sometimes. He says, you're the just person. You've been justified. You're living in accordance with God's will. And so he says, when it comes to that word righteousness, you've got to be better than these other guys. And he says, you have to exceed it. We know what the word exceed means. You're driving down the road and it says speed limit 55 miles an hour. And Mr. Highway Patrolman pulls you over and says you were going 67 in a 55. What does he really say? What does the ticket say? You exceeded the speed limit, right? You went above the upper limit. And so Christ is telling us, his disciples, those people who are trying to learn from him, those of us who are trying to find out what he wants us to do, he says you've got to surpass their righteousness. You've got to surpass what they're doing. You've got to go beyond it. There's a requirement here, and you've got to be better than they are. There's no silver medal. It's only first place or no place. So you've got to do better than they do. Well, who's he talking about? These scribes and these Pharisees. You know, why were they the best in town? Well, they were the legal scholars. They were the folks that when you wanted to ask an, a question about, about the old law, about Moses' law, you went to one of these guys. The scribes had been writing it down for years. The Pharisees were the ones who had the, knew, knew what it meant when everybody else did not. So they were the experts. You know, they were the teachers of the law. They were supposedly knew what God expected. And since they knew what God expected, they knew what righteousness was. And they were better at it than anybody. And here comes Christ saying, that's the best team in town, but you've got to be better. You've got to do it better than they do it. You know, you've got to exceed it. But here's the sort of the, the kicker to this whole thing. This sort of gives us an insight to man's eyes and God's eyes. Man was looking at these Pharisees and saying, they are the best. They are the ones to listen to. They are better than anybody else when it comes to being right with God. And Jesus says, in God's eyes, they're not. He's going to spend a lot of time over the next three years telling how they are not the best team in town. You know, that they, he's going to contrast what they're saying with what God says. And as he contrasts what they say with what God says, he says, look, they're not the best team. What God says always comes ahead of what they're doing. They're not living right. So here's the contrast. So he's giving us a challenge. Disciples, students, learners of me, 
you've got to be better. you got to exceed. you got to go past what they're doing. So let's look at this word righteousness a little more. It says we have to align, be in alignment with God's will. You know, when Roxanne and I were driving over here tonight, there was a incident, accident, I'm not really sure what it was, on the river bridge, right before the river bridge. And all of a sudden, two lanes of traffic had to go into one. Now, we all know what that means. There's always somebody that doesn't want to do it when they're supposed to, right? But at the end of the day, no matter what, we all had to get into one line. If we were going to get past that accident, there was only one way to do it. We all had to get in alignment to go past it. So when we talk about righteousness and standing right before God, we've got to get in alignment. Our will, our action, our behavior has got to line up right behind God. We can't get over in the other lane. We can't go over on the shoulder. So we got to be right in line. And so he says, this is the way we do this. Jesus says on your daily journey, on your daily living, you better start living right. You start better li live the way God intends for you to live. You better do what I'm about to tell you. It's got to be intentional. He's going to talk about things you have to be humble. You know, he talked about this poor in spirit. We're going to be part of this kingdom. He says, if you've got to line up. You know, your heart's going to have to change because of God's love for you. And now you've got to get in line. And you've got to act this way on this daily journey. We have to know what God's real will is. See, the Pharisees had decided the easiest way to be the best team in town is just to change the rules. To make them our own rules. So if they read something that God said do and they wanted to change it to make it easier, better, more advantage for them, they changed it. How would you like to play basketball and when you get to the gym that night, they say, oh, by the way, we're not the three-point line doesn't count tonight. Oh, but well, we got the best three-point shooters in town. Yeah, but it's not counting tonight. See, that's the way the Pharisees looked at things. We'll just change the rules. We'll add to them. We'll take away from them. We'll do whatever we want to. See, they were making up their own will, but they weren't aligning with God's will. And Jesus is about to point that out. And so, you know, what's the lesson there? The scriptures are important. If we want to be in alignment with God's will and know what it is, we've got to know these scriptures because that's where we find it. That's how we know what to do. That's how we know what to do. And we're going to have to reflect God's character. Jesus is going to spend some time here in this sermon. In this teaching setting, he's going to talk about how that we have to be like God. We have to be godly people. You know, that we have to reflect that. And it's not just about now, he said, just following the rules, but having our heart right when we do it. That what we say, do, and act all comes from our heart. So we're not worried about just doing it to follow the rules sake. We're doing it because we know that's what God wants us to do. That that's the right thing to do. So we're going to sincerely obey him. We're going to have a heart that seeks to know what he wants us to do. And we're going to have these same qualities as God. We're going to show love. We're going to show compassion for those who are hurting and those who are in need. We're going to have be humble people. We're going to have good hearts that cares about folks, that want to help folks. And, you know, we're going to be peaceful people who, who want to make peace with others, who want to live in that kind of world. So we have to know God's real will. We get that from the scriptures. So what about this caring for others? You know, the Pharisees talked a good game about caring for others. They said, we love other people. But did they really? <laughs> no. They did not, and their actions proved it. And so if we're going to be people who cares for others, Christ says a little later in chapter 7, you better treat people the way you want to be treated. Well, we like to be treated nice. We like to be treated good. He said, so why don't you treat other people that way? Pharisees were 
called hypocrites because they didn't do that. He said, so you need to care for others if you're going to be righteous. And you're going to have to have this right relationship with God through faith. The faith is an important part of this. Faith, it's going to take faith for you to change. It's going to take faith for you to start to believe what he's telling us, what Christ says to us. It's going to take faith to stand up to these Pharisees. And he says, finally, God's going to be the one that declares us righteous. Romans 6 and 18, he says, and having been set free from sin, you become slaves to righteousness. Now, we can't be righteous people until we've been set free from sin. He says, Paul, in that, there in Romans 6, it says that's through our act of baptism. Through us coming to Christ in obedience. He said we become slaves of righteousness. So we need to do that. So it all boils down to this, that we exceed what the Pharisees were doing. We exceed what others are doing. We exceed what this world is doing. So how does that happen? Well, first of all, he's going to challenge us to a deeper faith. Your faith has to become more than anybody else's. And you say, well, how can I do that? You know, I look around and there's some people that's got strong faith. But he says yours has to be as deep as you can get. It. And it's got to be reflected in, in, the, in your heart and in your actions. That you do the things that God wants you to do comes down to motivation. When you do something, you should think, what was I thinking about when I did that? What motivated me to, to do that? And Christ is going to give us some examples here in a second about things that we do differently, where we do exceed. But he says it's all, it all starts to do with what you're thinking. You're not, you can't think like everybody else thinks. You can't react like everybody else reacts. It's got to be different. You know, am I really doing what God asked me to do? Or have I fallen short? Well, it only comes when we ask ourselves, what was I thinking? Why did I react that way? So it comes down to some self-examination. We have to look into our heart. Christ is going to talk about the heart a lot. We're going to have to look at it and say, you know, why did I do that? Was it because that was the thing to do. Is that what God wanted me to do? Or was it what I wanted to do? And if it's what I wanted to do, we better make sure it aligned again with what God wanted us to do. We should pray for God's guidance. You know, it's nothing wrong with asking God for strength. Somebody does us wrong, sometimes we need to ask for strength. Somebody cheats us, we may need to ask for strength. Somebody does something that we are disappointed in. We may need to ask God for strength and guidance. Pray that your heart pleases God. That I know what God wants me to do and I'm trying my best to do what he wants me to do. You know, don't go to your friends and neighbors for approval because they'll tell you the wrong thing. These folks have been going to these Pharisees for years and saying, what should I do? And the Pharisees, well, you better wash your cup this way. You know, you better not walk too far. You better do this or you better do that. And it was the wrong thing to be told. And they believed it. And so they didn't truly know God's will. And so they needed God's guidance, and Christ was here to do that. They need to practice what Jesus teaches. We look at Jesus, we see genuine love. We see genuine kindness. So we need to make sure that as we go through life, you know, we look at those who are in need. We look at those who are mistreated. We look at our fellow brother and sister, that we become people who have this love and this kindness. People who will forgive. People who will be peaceful. You know, when we look at Jesus' teaching, he's telling us how to behave. How to live. How to act. And that's what we need to make sure we're doing. Let's talk about Bible study and worship in just a second. If we're going to have a deeper faith, it starts with that study of his word. It starts with that commitment to worship, to participate in the worship as he would have us to. 
you know, that we have this personal devotion that says, I'm going to attend the services of the church. How can we say we love God? How can we say we're exceeding if we don't attend the services? If we don't show up for Bible study, and if we don't do those on a personal level, how can we say we're exceeding? We're not doing anything that other people aren't doing either. So we have to have that personal devotion to that. If we're going to draw closer to God, it's going to start with Bible study and worship. And let's talk about this concept of the extra mile. See, Christ is going to say, if you want to exceed, here's some things to think about. Here's some things you need to do. If you want to exceed the expectation, then you've got to do better. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. The expectation was, if I ask that Pharisee, he's going to say, just go that one mile. That's all you got to go. See, what the, he was referring to was sometimes the Romans would say, carry this for me. A command. You've got to carry this for me. And the law said you only had to carry it a mile. And Christ said, if they ask you to carry it one mile, you carry it two. Isn't that exceeding? You know? He said that they asked you for your coat, you give them your cloak also. Isn't that exceeding? He says if they slap you on your right cheek, turn to you the other cheek, your left cheek. Isn't that exceeding? See, he's telling them if you want to be better than these Pharisees, then you're going to have to do these things that exceed others' expectations. Normally, people would not go any further than they had to. He said, you be people who go extra. You do extra. You go beyond what is required. You put forth some extraordinary kindness and service. As a Christian, are you known as someone who is kinder than anyone else? Or are you just looked at as just like everybody else? Well, sometimes he's kind, sometimes he's not. When you're looked at as a Christian, you know, do they look at you and say, if you need something, he'll give it to you. He'll help you. Or you look and say, don't bother him. He will never help you. See, he said, you've got to be exceptional. You've got to go beyond what other people do. What traditionally other people do, you have to be, do more than is required. Specifically in these areas of service, you're going to become a servant if you're going to serve God. How about when they're not a friend? When somebody that doesn't like you, shouldn't you be just a little kinder? That's not traditionally the way we look at it, is it? You don't like me, I don't like you. You slap me, I'm going to slap you back. Right? You ask me for something, I'm not going to give it to you. There's nothing extraordinary about that. There's nothing exceeding about that. Christ says you've got to be people who exceed you got to do better. Well, how do we determine when's, when it's enough? Well, okay, he asked me to go one, I'm going to go two, but I'm sure not going to go three. You know, he, gave, he asked for my coat, and I gave him my coat and my cloak. I'm sure not giving him the best. Those kinds of things. How did Jesus serve others? Did Jesus put limits on it? Did Jesus say, well, you know, I know you've got, uh, you're blind. I'll fix one eye, but not two. I know you can't walk. I'll fix one leg, but not both of them. No, Jesus always went as far as was needed. And so if we're going to be people who are exceeding the righteousness of others, of the world, we have to go be, we have to do what's needed. Don't stop until we get that done. That's the way we serve others. Let me ask you this question. How do you feel when someone does more than expected for you? When someone does something you weren't expecting, when someone gives you more than you asked for, when someone works harder for you than you were expecting, you know, don't we feel amazed sometimes? We feel grateful for what they've done. In verse 48 here in chapter 5, 
He says, if you do all these things, you're going to be perfect. Just like the Father's perfect. You know, when you hit perfection, you can't exceed that. You can't go past that. He says, you got to do these things until you reach perfection. Just like God is perfect. He said, do these things and you'll be perfect like that. Luke 17 and verse 10. He gives us a passage here where he says, And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down and eat? But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you're commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Who was going to get served? The master. Whose duty was it to serve him? The servant. Yeah. Here was a Lord and a servant, and the Lord's going to come first. And when he says when that happens... He said, that's just what's expected. You've done your duty. The word duty here is talking about responsibility. It's talking about a legal obligation. He said, you've just done your duty. You fulfill that legal obligation. You know, what you were responsible to do. He said, that's the performance that is expected of you. He said, you got to serve the master. The master comes first. And he said, and then when you sit around and say, well, I've done this. He said, all oh, it's just going to come down to this. You've just done what was expected. Don't go around saying, I look what all I've done. You know, he said, the master's going to say, I come first. <coughs> and in our Christian life, in our journey, the master always comes first. And so when we've done what is expected of us, he said, we've just done our duty. We fulfill that legal obligation. But here's the point. Minimal effort minimal work minimal diligence is failure when we say I've done the minimum it's all I can do I've done what I consider the bare minimum so he has to reward me he has to let me eat he has to let me drink The minimal effort is failure. So you've got to exceed. We couldn't stand around and say, look, I'm just as good as these Pharisees. Everything they say to do, that's what I'm doing. Everything they ask, that's what I'm doing. He says, no, you've got to fulfill that, and you've got to go beyond that, or you're an unprofitable servant. And then he gives us one other thought, and we'll start to wind down here. He says, look, you've been listening to these Pharisees, and he's going to use this quite a bit here in the Sermon on the Mount, this concept of you've heard, but I say. He's saying this is the traditional thinking. This is what's been going around. This is what the majority says. This is what all your friends and neighbors say. But here's what God says. And for some reason, they're not exactly the same. And for years, you've lived by what everybody else says, what you've heard. And here I'm going to come along, and I'm going to say, you know, there's something else. And I'm going to show you by example what that means. When they look at Christ, they saw someone who was going to be exceedingly doing the will of the Father. They're going to see someone who said, I'm here to do my Father's will. And then he says, I'm going to correct this teaching that you've been listening to that's wrong. I know they're the best in town. I know they're the leaders. I know they're up here on this pedestal, but they're wrong. Because they left out one thing, what God really intended. You know, if you want to succeed, you're going to have to look at me. I'm here to do the Father's will. Christ knew about the second mile. 
You think someone that's willing to die on the cross wasn't willing to exceed? Wasn't willing to do what was necessary? Willing to die for us as unworthy sinners? And listen to some of the examples he gave us. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan there in Luke chapter 10? Remember the man fell among thieves and they beat him up, took his clothes, cut him up, left him there to die on the side of the road. And here comes the priest. And he walks there and he sees him and he goes way out of his way to walk around. Next comes a Levite, religious person, walking down the same road, sees the man over there on the left, hurting, bleeding, walks way around, won't even look at him. And then here comes the Samaritan, the most hated person in, in Judea. And he sees him, and the Bible says he took compassion. He exceeded the righteousness of the Pharisees by his action. You remember the rest of the story. Put him on his animal, took him into the inn, bound his wounds up, left money there to pay for his care and keeping, and said, if I owe you more, I'll pay it when I get back. See, he was exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees. What about the tax collector and the Pharisee? As the Bible says in Luke 18, they both went up to the temple to pray. Here's the Pharisee standing there in the temple for everybody to see, saying, God, I thank you. I'm not like this other guy. I thank you. I am so much better than he is. I'm better than all these people that act like this. And here's the tax collector, again, one of the most hated people in the, in the world. And he gets up there and says, without looking up, without looking around, looking at the ground, says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. See, that's exceeding. Christ, when he was watching them put their money in the collection plate, everybody was putting in these $100 bills and these $1,000 bills, and here comes the little widow, and she puts in two pennies. And he calls his disciples together and he goes, you know, look at this. She's giving out of poverty. She's giving out of not having anything. She's giving all she has. These other folks are giving out of their abundance. And so she's more justified. What he's saying is, look at all of these different examples. I'm, going to, I'm teaching you a different way to live. Quit living like these Pharisees who only live for themselves. Start living the way God wants you to live. Start acting and doing this. this. So this is a new teaching. This is a new way of thinking. How does it exceed? How about in your personal life? Every one of us have friends, neighbors, classmates, people we work with. How do you treat them? How do you act around them? Are you acting like a Pharisee? Are you acting like everybody else acts? Or are you somebody that's kinder, gentler, humbler? You know, that's willing to do the things that are godlike. Christ is going to teach here in this same chapter about look at your enemies. I'm going to tell you something new. The Pharisees would tell you. You know, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I'm going to tell you to love your enemy. Wait a minute. That's different. That's new. That's exceeding. How about at church, in your church life? How are you going to exceed there? You know, are you going to be someone who's trying to grow personally in the church? That you're putting in that effort to grow in your knowledge of God's word and your application of God's word? Are you someone who volunteers for things? Do you help when it's needed? Do you ever ask, can I help? We have a new brother at Calera. And he asked me 14 times yesterday when we were having our men's breakfast, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? You know, and you just, you can't help but love somebody who is asking to help. 
So do you have that kind of attitude? See, the Pharisees, you don't help, I don't help, you help me. And Christ says, you've got to exceed that. So now you're the one who's asking if you can help. So when it comes to church, what can you do? And I guarantee you, if you ask to help, you're doing more than most. But there's always something to do. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So we should always be that way. If we're going to be exceeding people, we do that. How about in our community? Do you give of your means to help others? Do you show acts of kindness to folks in need around you? You know, when you see that guy standing on the corner with the little sign that says, you know, I need help, or whatever it says, do we start to look at him and say, oh, I bet you, you know, I got a story behind you. I know what you really, you really don't need my help. Sometimes we start to take that pharisaical look at things, don't we? But maybe we ought to look at it a little different. Maybe there's someone who we could help. Someone who needs a friend, someone who needs something <laughs> from us, service. The congregation at Clare, we started over, oh, I don't know, six months ago, helping out the crisis center in Durant. The crisis center is for battered women and abused women and, and folks like that. And all they asked was that we donate little bottles of shampoo and toiletries and things like that. We started taking big boxes full of them. The congregation responded, started bringing all kinds of stuff. What do you think the crisis center thinks about the church at Calera now? Every time we see them, thank you. Thank you. Why? Because we're exceeding what other folks are doing. And that's what we should do everywhere. So, as we end, what's the main point? Always remember... Always remember who you serve. You don't serve a group of people over here who's telling you what to do. You don't serve a group like these Pharisees. You serve God Almighty. You serve his son through his church. So since you're his servant and you have that one master, you do what he asks. You do what he demands. You put him first. And when you put him first, he's going to tell us that over, you know, in chapter 6, verse 33, to seek his kingdom first. When we put him first, we're exceeding. And when we start to exceed, we're going to be successful. We're going to get to enter that kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. If we're willing to do his will, as he's going to end the, the, the sermon with him, chapter 7. We're going to do his will. Then we will be successful. If we don't do it, we're going to be like that foolish man and the house is going to fall flat. So tonight I want you to do some self-examination. Think about how you view, view the world. Young people, think about what you're going to do at school tomorrow. You know, when that bully picks on you, what are you going to do? When that classmate doesn't smile at you, what are you going to do? When somebody makes fun of you, what are you going to do? Well, we know what everybody else does, but we have to react differently. We have to be totally different. We have to think, I'm doing what God wants me to do, what Jesus wants me to do. So tonight, anybody has a need? Anybody needs some help? Anybody needs the prayers of this congregation? And we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.